2013 NBA Finals Game 6 The San Antonio Spurs lead the Miami Heat three games to two. It is the end of the game, and the Spurs hold a three-point lead. If the clock hits zero, and the Heat haven't converted a three-point shot, San Antonio will win the championship. What happens next will be remembered forever. Long go! Rebound box! Back out to Allen! His three-pointer! Bang! Unprecedented. Ray Allen's three forced overtime, which the Miami Heat won, which forced a winner-take-all Game 7, which the Miami Heat won. It's one of the great collapses, one of the most devastating heartbreaks ever. It's one of those things that just never happens. And it's even more curious because of all the teams it could have happened to, the last one you would ever expect would be the Spurs. We're talking about the model organization of basketball. Since drafting Tim Duncan in 1997, the Spurs hadn't missed the playoffs once, had it won at less than a 50 win rate, and had claimed four championships. They defined culture. Whether or not your team could play like the Spurs, you wanted your team and your organization to behave like the Spurs. No ego, extreme accountability, and a level of buy-in and belief that was self-fulfilling. As head coach Greg Popovich liked to say, not everyone could play for the Spurs. They wanted guys who had gotten over themselves. Guys who either had nothing to prove or who had everything to prove. That buy-in and accountability, made possible by Tim Duncan's sublime example and enforced by Pop's brutal honesty and competitive fire, made the Spurs perhaps the most disciplined, consistent institution in all of sports. Yet, they were the ones who came as close to winning a championship as anyone has ever come without actually winning. How do you come back from that? If you're the Spurs, how do you come back from that? You still had a chance to win in overtime of Game 6. You still had a chance to win in Game 7. Even more, this could have been the last run for the Spurs. Their big three of Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, and Tony Parker were going to turn 37, 36, and 31 years old respectively during the following season. Well past their physical primes in a league with young stars like LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, and the like. Despite their success, the Spurs had never made back-to-back -back finals appearances. With those kind of obstacles staring at you in the face, how do you find it in yourself to sit through an entire offseason, gruel through an 82-game regular season, and fight through a whole postseason just to get another chance at the ring you almost had? Then again, if there was ever a team that could look at those obstacles and think to themselves, yeah, we can get it done, it would be the Spurs. That journey started in the offseason where Popovich convened the Spurs in Colorado Springs at the Air Force Academy, his alma mater. Nearly every major contributor from the year prior had returned to the team and now possessed a powerful unifying force. Shared trauma. Pop harnessed that potential from day one. The first day of training camp at the Air Force Academy, the Spurs did little beside dissect in painful detail every possession of Game 6. For hours, they relived their nightmare and saw all the mistakes they'd each made. No one was blameless. Ginobili and Kawhi Leonard had missed free throws that would have iced the game. Every spur on the floor failed to secure LeBron's missed three. Popovich opted not to have Duncan on the floor at that moment so he could have better perimeter defense. And they all failed to recollect themselves and rally for game seven. The point in all this, of course, was that it was not a single failure or an individual who would cost them. There were moments all throughout Game 6 and all throughout Game 7, mistakes by everyone that could have changed things. They had lost, but they understood that they lost as a team. And if that was true, if they were to win, they would have to win as a team. It was a testament to the kind of character that Popovich was convinced these players had, that they could confront this nightmare and reckon with it, rather than avoid it, downplay it, or run from it. To find that the best way out is through, Stare at the sun and let that feeling of failure motivate them to win for themselves and for each other. And that's all great, but seriously, how many times has a team lost a championship and said that kind of stuff? Every team that loses on the highest stage thinks that they're just one step away. But more often than not, 
The reality of making that arduous climb again is just too much. Did these spurs really have what it would take? But first, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Keeps. Hair loss. It's something that most guys spend their lives in fear of. You look at your dad, you look at your grandfathers, all your uncles, and you start to see your shiny, hairless future reflected in those scalps. And did you know that two out of three guys will experience hair loss by the time they're 35? Luckily, there's Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that offers clinically proven, researched back treatments right to your door that can help stop hair loss and improve hair growth all without visiting a doctor's office or pharmacy. All Keeps treatment plans are doctor recommended and their physicians will help you select the right products and treatments for your specific hair goals, even if it's as simple as just taking care of the hair you already have. Don't be like your dad. Break the hair loss cycle. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash Clayton or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Clayton. Six months later, the answer was obvious. They did, in fact, have what it takes. In maybe the most loaded Western Conference ever, the grit and grind Grizzlies, the Lob City Clippers, the Dwight and Harden Rockets, the Westbrook and Durant Thunder, plus emerging teams like the Warriors and the Trailblazers. In that Western Conference, the Spurs finished with a 62-20 record, the best in basketball and the franchise's best since 2006. They led the league in assists per game, three-point field goal percentage, and plus-minus. Pop was named Coach of the Year. Tony Parker was a second-team All-NBA selection, and Kawhi a second-team All-Defensive selection. And that's kinda it. This team did not thrive on star power. Sure, they had the best power forward ever, but he's not a traditional star. And sure, they had the winningest trio in basketball history. Yeah, Kawhi was slowly developing into one of the most devastating two-way forces in the league, but they didn't rely on any one player. In fact, not one of their players, not Tony Parker, not Kawhi, not even Tim Duncan, averaged over 30 minutes a game. This team thrived on its depth and on the strength of that roster as a single, cohesive unit. You didn't have to worry about stopping one or two guys. You had to worry about stopping eight or nine guys. The results speak for themselves. And beyond just the attitude and culture of the Spurs, it was their ability and willingness to give chances to and find success in guys that had been discounted that made them the envy of front offices everywhere. The Spurs were one of the first teams to really start scouting international players, exploiting a market inefficiency because of a stigma surrounding those players' toughness. The fact that some of the best players in the league today are foreign players is an afterthought. I certainly pay little mind to the fact that guys like Luka Doncic, Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic, and Giannis Antetokounmpo were born outside of the U.S. We know that great players can come from anywhere. The Spurs deserve credit for reminding us of that. That roster consisted of an NBA record 10 international players. Duncan was born in the Virgin Islands and was a no-brainer with the first pick in 97. But Parker was the 28th pick in the draft out of France and went on to become a finals MVP. Ginobili was a late second rounder out of Argentina who would go on to become an Olympic gold medalist and one of the greatest six men in basketball history. Guys like Marco Bellinelli, Aaron Baines, Patty Mills, Tiago Splitter, and Boris Diaw were guys who came from all across the globe, Italy, Australia, France, and found places as vital contributors on the best team in basketball. They were guys who had nothing to prove or who had everything to prove. And to watch those guys play together, to see the way they interacted, how much they enjoyed each other's company, both on and off the court, it really does give credence to the culture that Pop preached, that the Spurs were and are a family it's something that was carefully cultivated. No egos, no squeaky wheels. After the games, almost all of them, the Spurs go out to dinner. And if you ever played for the Spurs, for a career or a season, and Pop knows you're in town, you're getting invited to dinner. We roll our eyes when people talk about playing the game the right way, because we know that most of the time, when the chips are down and push comes to shove, those words are just words. It's easy to do when it's easy. 
it's hard to do when it's hard. That's what makes the Spurs special. They did play the right way. They did excel as a team. They did sacrifice. Manu took a 50% pay cut to help make salaries work. In fact, the salaries for the entire big three, Duncan, Parker, and Manu, combined for only $2 million more than Kobe Bryant made by himself. In a sport where shots mean points and points mean paychecks, the Spurs, over and over again, gave up good shots for better shots. Without imposing athletes or stunning singular talent, the Spurs adopted a more European style of play, perfect for their international roster. Cutting, passing, and shooting became paramount. Spacing, screens, kickouts, and cuts kept the offense in constant motion and was made possible only because the Spurs were utterly selfless with the basketball and ruthlessly intelligent in their decision making. They got the best shots in the sport all year long because they bought in to a higher ideal. And they bought in because they were all committed to a single goal. They were peaking at the right time, too. They finished the season having won 22 of their last 26 games, including a franchise record 19 game winning streak. So what the hell happened in the first round? It's the fly in the ointment for the Spurs team as a first tier all time great team, taken to seven in the first round by the eight seed Dallas Mavericks. Now, was the West loaded? Absolutely. Were the Mavs better than your average eight seed? Sure. Was there some cross-state rivalry, and did Vince Carter steal a game to extend the series? Most definitely. But still, you can't be the greatest team ever if you nearly lost in the first round of the playoffs. Maybe they were looking ahead, so fixated on their pursuit of revenge that they allowed themselves to be removed from the moment and taken to the brink. Whatever the reason, they did ultimately overcome it and beat the Mavs to advance to the second round where they throttled the Portland Trailblazers in five games. In the Western Conference Finals, they were tested by the Oklahoma City Thunder, a proud group in their own right who believed they were the team of the future. The hungrier Spurs outlasted OKC in six games, sending themselves to back-to-back -back finals for the first time in franchise history. And there they were, the NBA Finals, again. The Spurs had pushed themselves to grow and to improve for an entire year, over 8,000 hours, over 500,000 minutes, with this phantom haunting their dreams. And now they were here, against the very team that had beaten them, no less. A rematch. Spurs Heat, round two. This far-off goal, this illusory motivator, was here in the flesh, and now they could do something about it. The Spurs took Game 1, famously remembered as a game when the arena's air conditioning system failed and temperatures reached the 90s in the summer Texas heat. The Heat narrowly won Game 2, evening the series and stealing home court advantage. And then, in Game 3, the floodgates opened. Boris Diaw was inserted into the starting lineup and seemed to unlock something in the San Antonio offense. He was a maestro and he raised their level of play. The passes, the movement, and the shots that the Spurs had been getting all year long, the best in basketball, somehow became even better. They operated in perfect concert with each other, reacting to passes almost before they'd happened, anticipating movement before it had even begun. They buried the Heat offensively and smothered them on defense. Kawhi, who had done an incredible job guarding LeBron the year prior, was just as effective, earning him nicknames like Kryptonite and Kingslayer. He was named the Finals MVP after San Antonio prevailed in five games. It was startling to watch the Spurs. Striking. It was incredible. Poetic. It's remembered as the beautiful game. When they were clicking, it was the best basketball anyone's ever seen. You almost literally can't play better. The stats back it up. In the fourth quarter of game one, the Spurs shot 87%, a finals record. In game three, they shot 75% in the first half, a finals record. They led 71 to 50 going into halftime of that game, the first 70 point half in the finals since the 87 Lakers. They shot 52% from the field in the series, a finals record. Kawhi shot 61% from the field, 
a record for a Finals MVP. They averaged 120.8 points per 100 possessions in the series, the most since data began in 1985. In over 293 games, the Heat had not once lost three games in a row with LeBron James in their lineup. The Spurs won games three, four, and five by an average of 19 points. In those three games, they made 157 more passes than the Heat per game. Those games also just so happened to add up to the best offensive rating over three games since that data became available over 30 years ago. They won the finals with a point differential of 70. Over five games, they outscored the Heat by 70 points. And they lost one of those games. It remains the highest point differential in NBA Finals history. The stats back it up. But honestly, whatever. Those are afterthoughts. We didn't need to look at the stats to know what we were watching. It was perfect. Like someone had turned the sliders up on a video game. Like the Spurs had turned the difficulty down for themselves. But my god, they were playing against the Heat. The Heatles, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh. It was like watching all this energy, all this angst and anger and heartache radiate out of them and materialize into perfect basketball. People talk about this Spurs team as deserving to be in the best team ever conversation purely because of how dominant they were in the finals. Because we all saw that when the Spurs were at their best, they were capable of transcendence. They found success in the same vein as Isaiah's Pistons and Bill Russell's Celtics, tapping into the core concept of basketball, the platonic idea of basketball. The fact that the Spurs were echoing the sentiments of teams from as far back as the 60s means they weren't breaking any new ground by emphasizing team play. But as the NBA continues to become a more star-driven league, their style was anything but. They're my favorite team ever. I love Tim Duncan. I love that he exists as proof that success doesn't have to be this Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, in-your-face screaming asshole. It can also be him or Bill Russell, who led by example, with encouragement and sympathy and humility. I love the relationship that he and Pop have. It's unlike anything else in sports. They've been described as everything from an old married couple to soulmates. They love each other. Tim's referred to Pop as a father figure to him. I love the fact that the Spurs were made up of international guys who teams had either overlooked or given up on that the locker room was a collage of national flags. I love that this team really seemed to be friends, that they enjoyed each other's company, that they sacrificed and wanted to see each other succeed. And I loved watching their wounds heal in real time, shot after shot. I've talked before about Bill Russell, and when I did, I talked about the platonic idea of basketball. The idea of the sport that transcends just the shooting and the scoring and gets to the spirit of the thing itself. It's impossible to pin down or define what exactly that idea is, but its effects and results are impossible to miss. We see it here in the 2014 Spurs. We see the same things we saw in those Celtics teams of old. Things like compassion, selflessness, Solidarity, resiliency, and triumph. It was important for their catharsis that the Spurs played the heat. They had brought out the best in each other, and the Spurs were able to get the last laugh and avenge their loss. But by the end of the series, the Spurs hadn't just got revenge over the heat. They'd achieved redemption for themselves. And they did it in a special, aesthetic, beautiful way. I love this team, because in the wake of the most devastating loss in basketball history, the San Antonio Spurs responded together. And together, they played the best basketball that's ever been played.